in the house, let me hear you say yeah. Welcome to Legend Conversation number five. Let's get to the show. Um, it's really an honor to welcome Alchemist. Let's give him a warm, wa- warm give Alchemist welcome. Alchemist, big hands, guy. Bring it to the, the stage. Alchemist. The Alchemist, y'all. The Alchemist. The Alchemist. What up, man? Come take a seat. You're in the, the legend conversation hot. Yo, yo. Okay, this is hot. This is hot. What's up, y'all? How you it doing? is hot. The lights are the lights are bright. I'll right. say that. We're hot. We're hot. We're live. Um, We're live. live. Man, is on. Um, Al, I, I like your shoes. Al. I like your shoes. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, they're, they're local, local, Chicago, they're locally, Chicago bred. fresh, right? Yes, yes, sir. That's my man. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> um, man, thank you for coming. I wasn't sure if this was gonna happen. I think our last email confirming it, you just wrote back. That sounds good. <laughs> that sounds like a response I would do. Yeah, and mm. I ran it. Few words. I ran it through several people that know you. One of them, Rude One, and I was like, I, he said bet sounds good. That's a go. Does that mean it's confirmed? That, mean, that means it's good. That it's means it's go. good. Yeah, he was like, yeah. It's a, it's a go. Um, confirmed. But man, um, thank you for coming. I want to talk a bit tonight uh, about what you did, you know, how you got here, but also what you're, what you're doing in the future. The first thing, though, I wanted to ask you, we um, had an in-store earlier today. Yes. And you, you saw a lot of people come through the doors. I'm just curious... What like does that? What do you get out of that? Do you enjoy like seeing the people? Like how does that impact maybe what you do or how you you maneuver? So just two seconds. If y'all didn't know or if y'all haven't seen on social media, it was a line from here all the way to North Avenue, guys. You know what I'm saying? It was literally down the street. No cap. Yeah, I mean that's kind of why we do it. You know, right. I think um, what we do is like for a select few. It's not we don't do like commercially uh, appreciated stuff sometimes. It's like a small fan base. But I feel like when I can do events like that, like I could see the ones that really fuck with us. You know, it's not, it's it's like the actual ones. And a lot of times I do stuff like that. Like we'll do like tours overseas a lot. Mm-hmm. And I always end up doing shit overseas. And I always hear people like, yo, why you don't ever do LA or New York or Chicago? Right. And it's like, I always wanted to do shit like that. But I feel like... Um, there wasn't a demand for it where I think now there's a better time where we could do like an event like this. Right. We could chop it up at the nighttime and afterwards I could do a set. A set, And right. in the daytime we could do a pop-up. And Handle the business. The people. Yeah. And <laughs> right. even more than that, it's like, it's like, you know, online when you make the sales, it, you, it goes well, but sometimes you have like bots and people who mm-hmm. like shit like that that, mm-hmm. that buy up so a lot you, of the product. So you get real life, real this life is, in action. A bot can't stand in line. Exactly. You know? So if somebody's in line, it's like an actual person mm-hmm. who fucks with you from day one and mm-hmm. it's not like a halfway thing. And, and, and fucks with you yeah. enough to come stand in line, come yeah. take a time out that day, stand yeah. in line, yeah. purchase whatever, post yeah. it, do it, even if they don't post yeah. it, but, but love it. And I, I was always, like, I'm still a fan, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, I've always been a fan of like, my, like my brother that I grew up with, like he was mm-hmm. not that type. Okay. He's like, yo, you you gassed up, man. Why do you give a shit? He's just a regular person. Right, like, right, as right. As a kid, like if I could have seen like Slick Rick, or something, right, like, yeah. I would have lost my mind. Yeah. yeah. I would have been like, yo, you know. And and there were some people I met over the years that helped me. Like, wow. Mm-hmm. Like you know, they say don't meet some of the people you look up to. Like that's true to a degree, but a lot of people are cool too. Yeah. Everybody's not a dick. You know what right, I mean? Right. You don't have to be that look, look, way. Look, you don't have to. Ow, ow, ow. You're, yeah. you're cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. But I, you yes, know, sir. This is a couple you might meet and be like, damn, I wish <laughs> I never met him. And I, yeah. <laughs> I could say that to about a couple mm-hmm. people, but for the most part, it was like, I always felt like we're just people. You know what I mean? I'm, yeah. I'm doing some shit just like you might be doing. We're all being creative. And, and to be honest, like creativity goes across the map. So it's not really just music. So if somebody's a chef or if somebody make shoes or as a designer or whatever right. it is, it's like we could pretty much relate because we're like coming up with shit in our head and we're like, we might think we're crazy sometimes. Yep. Yeah. And then you're like, you, you, you might even get frustrated trying to explain it to somebody. Right. Like, nah, I'm telling you, you, right. you, you don't see what I'm saying? Right. It's like, like, what you mean? No, they don't, but you have to make that dish right. or make that shoe or make that beat and then once you do that, they come around and go, come, okay, yeah. I see it. I see. So, I, I see, can relate I to that. I see. Right, yes. right, right. You know what I mean? Right. 
Definitely. Um, yeah, what you mentioned, I wanted to, I, is something I was thinking about. I know someone came through and they were like, they look like maybe four, 13, 14 years old. Their mom brought them to, yeah. the, to the in-store. And then I remember seeing, I think through um, Jeff Weiss's blog, who's actually here. Shout out to Jeff. Was, That's my guy. Shout out there to was, Jeff. Shout out to Jeff. There was, a sto- there was a video of you hosting a like hip hop talk show as, I don't know how old you were, but not very, like, were you in high school? I was in you? high school, yes. Wow. I'm, yes. So, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious. Like, <laughs> like wow. When, uh, as someone who, when I was in high school, envisioned, like, had the, had the, uh, before the bell, like, you could have a radio show. Yeah, yeah. It's like emailing. I would email, like, the BC Boys every day to interview them. on them. Just on it. They were like, no, nah, we're not doing that. Eventually, it happened. But really? that's another story. Yep, yep. That's what's up. That's what I'm um, talking about. But, how, like, what's the, what's the time frame when you were, like, discovering the music to, like, I'm going to start a uh, cable. I mean, I don't know if it was cable access. It was but, a cable access yeah. show. Um, Mike Karen, actually, who was a big uh, uh, record label executive, w- went on to do a lot of stuff um, in uh, Atlantic. And he was, like, exper- uh, um, influential in a lot of artists. But it was a person I went to high school with. Okay. And he made beats at the time. There was another kid, Adam Weitzman, who now does Real Bad Man, the clothing mm-hmm. line. Mm-hmm. These were, like, guys we went to school with. So, like... I was already rapping and doing my music stuff, and they they um they had to connect at the school to do like a show, and they would literally like solicit the labels, like go to um, Delicious Vinyl at the time and be like, "Yo, you got the Master Ace Slaughterhouse album? All right, yeah. we made the video." And they would get the VHSs, and you know they had access because the school was Beverly Hills High School, so it was mm. like they were okay. like, "Cool, we have a, a a channel. You guys can do a show," and and um they kind of like. Just, we, I don't know. I don't even remember how it happened, but it was like, yeah, I'll host it. Yeah, cool. Right. You know what I mean. And I grew up watching you on TV raps and you know, basement and um, so like this is my yeah, time. Joe this Claire, is my time. Right. yeah, all of that. It was just right, like, right. wow, okay, cool. Right. And, and I got it. Yeah, and uh, we used to do it at Fred Siegel's, which was like a clothing store, which is still in still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On like, Melrose. Yeah, I bought a were, fine brush for my wife at Fred Siegel's. Really? Actually, <laughs> yes. And they even had this place called uh, Larry Parker's. Uh, it was called the Hip Hop Larry Parker's Hip Hop. Shake Shop, and it was in Beverly Hills, like right where the original California Pizza Kitchen was okay. on Beverly Drive. It was like this block in Beverly Hills where all these restaurants nice. were like birthed. And that place was like, they were like the hip hop shake shop. And they, like, it was wow. weird. Like, they embraced rap early on. Wow. And like, everybody used to come. In. I remember that was the first time I saw the Bad Boy poster with, mm. with um, Big as like the baby or yep. like the, the original yeah, yeah. promo poster that they had. I don't know if it was big. It was a baby on the poster. Mm-hmm. But, you know, basically... <laughs> it, was a, it was a baby. Yes. It may not have been big. No, <laughs> right. no it was big. Big okay. was the baby. The yes. baby okay. big. Yeah. But it was like an early time in LA and um, there were a couple of avenues that we had and uh, that show was cool because it kind of like um, helped me get my chops up and I, like, I did an interview. I remember I interviewed Guru Okay. Time. Wow. Nice. He came to the Mondrian Hotel, and I have the tape because Adam, he kept all the tapes and showed it to me, and it's such a trip because years later I would move to New York and become friends with Premier, and then I would meet Guru, and that's when they were doing nice. uh, the Moment of Truth album, and yeah. I would hang with them. But it was funny because I reminded him, he's like, "Man, oh shit, you were the, right. the kid that, that did would be, the interview." That would be dope footage for the the Alchemist. Yes, Netflix, yes, the yes. Alchemist Netflix. Joint. It exists. Right. It exists. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm rest in peace, Guru. You know that yep. was like a, rest in peace, Guru. Yeah, yep. man, he was like a real cool dude. And like I, you know, those people. When I first moved to New York, like I met Premier uh, on the Solus. I know we're moving around, but I met yeah, Premier on the Soul Assassins tour in '93 when I was opening for Cypress. Mm-hmm. I was in a group of hooligans, and um, he came to the show. And you know, Premier was like my idol. Mm-hmm. Even in '93, Premier was like the height. Yep, he was mm-hmm. always like. On another level, and, super uh, producer. I think yeah. you, you told me before uh, if you saw a premiere's name on an album, you just that one hundred. I mean, come on. I think anyone in this room could say like you know whenever you would see his name on a record, it was pretty much like I know that's going to be something. It was right. like, he yep. really rarely let you down. Sometimes he would show up once or twice on the record, you know. Right. But um, spit spit something a little bit. Yeah, and, but, and and he was like, I met him in '93. We did the Soul Assassins tour. And uh, we performed at the Rose Lane in New York. And uh, even, uh, rest in peace, DJ AM, who was actually a friend of mine at the time who was just rolling with A lot of people don't know, AM was a real rap. He yeah. came from Philly, moved to LA. I remember the first time I met him, he looked like MC Search. And he had a long <laughs> trench coat on, and he, he had like gazelles, and he was trying to rap yeah. at this club wow. called Ballistics in LA. 
And um, we know we had been became friends after that. He was actually with me because wow. he was just rolling with us on the tour. And there's, there might be a photo of me and my man Scott, uh, Dave Lott, went from D&D Studios and Premiere. And nice. we smoked a blunt like backstage, and it was like one of those moments where I was like, "Damn, I smoked a blunt with DJ Premier, yeah, right?" And yeah, and it, you know, right. And yeah. so years later, well, not many years, but it was probably like ninety. This was like ninety three, so maybe three years later, I would go to um, college in New York. Yep, yep. And uh, yep. I don't remember how I bumped heads with Premier. It might have been he Tony. Told me Touch. it was weed. It was about <laughs> weed, but it was. I'm trying to remember who linked us, but it might have been Tony Touch. But what was what was weed? Which made you bump weed? Like well, like I had weed. access. He had the weed. I had like, access. I was from you LA. Had the weed. Yeah, I grew up oh, in LA. Come allegedly. on, let's allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. long time okay, statue okay. of limitations. Me people would request premiere. Can you call your homie with the weed? Allegedly, yeah, yeah. It was a bad reputation. You know, it was, right. I didn't want to be known for that. You know, gotcha. I, I was from LA. We smoked pretty. Well, pretty, pretty good. Yep. Yeah, yeah, you know. Now it's everywhere though. Like yesterday, yeah. I got some weed, at, or even today, somebody came by. I was right. Great day. So he uh, did. Shout yeah, out man. to Chicago. They got the fire hey, too. Hey, Everybody fire. has it now. But back then, it was like if you were from LA, it was kind of special. Yeah, right. I and I was I was posted up. Allegedly, you know, in New York, allegedly. Allegedly. Oh. allegedly. And, um, yeah, that was um. When I ended up going to D and D one day, and I linked with Premier, and he remembered me, mm -hmm. and um. He was just like, oh, man, what's up? And I was like, yeah, I live out in New York now. I'm going to school. I'm working on beats. And that's kind of how me and him built like a friendship. And that, mm. that to me, Premier is like, I couldn't, I don't even know how to explain it. Like at that time, being around him was, was I felt anointed. Like, damn, right. I'm mm. getting to listen to some shit. They were making mm. the Moment of Truth album. He used to work. He was, I remember he was working like he was working with Jay-Z and I would be there. And he'd be like, mm. yeah, this is Al, man. He got beats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's dope. You got to check him out. Right. I was. That's I didn't. Crazy. wasn't even. Ha I didn't even have fire yet. I was still right. developing, but I always felt like Premier. He, that was a height of confidence. You right. know what I'm saying? Because his, his he stamp. Was so his confident. Stamp. Right. Like he never. It was just like, yo, this kid is dope too, and it, that meant a lot to me. You know, yeah. like and and uh, you know those days. Like I remember uh, when he was doing a million and one. Okay. And you know the beat that was like a three day session they were in the studio and mm. I remember he was there for because you know they used to come to him in the end of the albums and shit. Okay, he used to be like, yeah, you got to yep. come to me in the end, and he would, you know, last records and shit. Mm. And then he uh, he was there for two days, and he made that record. You know how the beat switches in the second part of a million and one. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then I remember the next day Teflon from MOP came to listen to the record and Premier played it for him. And when the beat switched. Yo, he jumped out of his seat like a Toyota commercial. Remember the oh, what a feeling! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he jumped out of his seat like he won the Super Bowl. Teflon, Teflon. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. It was just funny to me, like those little moments I remember as a kid. Like, damn, you know, Premier was, you know, it was unbelievable, and I felt like having access to that studio, living mm -hmm. in New York, and he knew I was in New York. He remember me from the Soul Assassin days. I yeah. still had the ring on. Mm -hmm. He knows I'm like, you know, Mugs, little homie. Yeah, but, talk, yeah. talk, talk, talk I, about I, that. Yeah. Yeah, we could go. We could go back. I wanted, yeah. I wanted to because I inter I last talked to Mugs maybe last year as a full grown man and was still intimidated. <laughs> so I have no idea. Like what? Me too. What, me too. What, me what too. was it like as a teenager being in the room with like DJ Mugs? I just I just like and how do you? How did you? As a kid, like you're in the room with you're yeah, on tour with yeah. Cypress Hill at the at the like this was. Uh, 93 Black Sunday Yeah Black Sunday I mean the height they're in the they're in the Simpsons How as a kid did you yeah, like Mugs was that? scary man like the first whole tour I don't think I talked to him once <laughs> The whole tour cuz we were like we got signed by B Real Okay you know like Mugs at the time was the big producer And uh the story goes that like, I didn't know till later Okay you know the way it went was we got signed by B Real who started a production company and signed me and Scotty to the Hooligans the Tommy Boy Later over the years, once I got to be friends with Mugs and we built a relationship, I became a producer. He was like, yo, that day you guys came to the office, he was like, they came and brought your shit to me first. Wow. Because he was the producer, you know, wow. he was, it was Mugs. You know? yeah. and they were like, yo, you want to make some money? We got these white kids from Beverly Hills, man. You gotta, <laughs> and like, the managers, he told me they pitched them some shit that sounded really whack. Wow. He was like, hell no, I'm not doing that. Wow. Right. And Be Real was there. Okay. And B really didn't have um, any stuff that he was producing. He was an MC, so he kind of gave us a shot. And I always tell B like, "Damn, man, you you gave us the green light." Like, you know, there was other things we could have done at the time, but the way it went, B kind of lit us up. 
and he, you know, he gave us an opportunity. And uh, so I always thank B to this day, like, man, you gave us a shot. And then, then I, I fuck with mugs now, like, yeah, yeah. man, you wouldn't fuck with me, man. Yeah. <laughs> but over the years, like after the hooligans thing fizzled out and didn't really happen, and Tommy Boy like didn't put the record out. Um, be real moved to Venice Beach. He bought like a crib out there. I don't remember why, but he decided he just liked Venice, mm-hmm. and he bought a crib out there and built a studio in the backyard. And then that's when I started like really honing my craft of making beats. He had an ASR back there. He had a bunch of crates, and Mugs used to come over there to see B, and he would see me, and he was like, "Oh, the little homie, you know, from yeah. the group. Okay, he's in the garage. He's making beats now." And I knew how to use the ASR really good. And at the time, Mugs was. Uh, and uh, SP-1200, strictly. And he would have like, you know, the SP only had like nine seconds of sample time or something like mm-hmm. that. So he would line three MPC, uh, SP-12s up. Okay. Three SP-12s up and he would MIDI them all and it would be three discs, floppy discs for one fucking beat. And he wow. would have crazy sounds and he was just like pushing the SP to the fullest extent. Wow. And then I, then I was using the ASR when he met me. And he kind of liked how that shit sounded, but he never really liked how the drum sounded out of the ASR. Cause you know, really the ASR was like, like Jake one can do it good, Notch can do it good, Timberland, like the ones who do it good, do it mm. good, but it's tough to make your drums like sound gritty because it's not a drum machine. Mm-hmm. It's a keyboard, it's a sampler, but it was like, if you're doing R&B or shit like that, it was like perfect. It's perfect. But it was like, right. to make the drums, I used to like struggle but I would have to do a lot of pre-EQing and shit to get it right. And when I would work with Muggs, he didn't really like my drums. But yeah. is, that, is, that your, is that your weapon of choice? At the time. Over At time, time, I changed. Okay. Like now, I use, I use the 2500 the MPC. But gotcha. for like so many years, ASR was like, I could literally, like when it would get dark and it'd be dark in the room and I'd just be still working. Like it was just, you know, everybody who makes beats here knows once you know a machine or your computer, you, you really don't have to think. Yeah, once you get to the point where you don't have to think to do your shit, Mm-hmm. Then you, you start getting more fluid with it. Mm-hmm. And then that's how the ASR was for a while. Mm-hmm. But for with Muggs, when I first started working with him, he was like, no drums. Yeah. So he would, be, he would do the drums on the SP. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I would kind of, that, that was the Black Sunday album. So there was like, that was like my first that's crazy, man. training ground that's of wild. like mm-hmm. making beats on a, on a high level. Because you know, mm-hmm. B Rail was B Rail. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm just wondering too, like, I think about um, when we had Jazzy Jeff here last time, I was talking about just like, Things he learned as a DJ, like cult, like we were talking about DJ lessons that translate to life skills, possibly. And I'm curious, like, are there things that you learned from Mugs outside of music of just like how to conduct yourself as a, a producer? Or you, I've seen you talk in interviews about like the producer community. Like, yeah. are there tenants of of this? Are there things that several? You, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. There's, there's I got all type of like. What does it mean to comrades. be a member of that? Yeah. What does it I mean, mean to be a comrade? <laughs> I might meet you today and you play me a beat and I'm like, I look at you like you're in, you're in, you're one of us. It doesn't have to, there's no like, you don't have to fill out or go through a a thing. You know what I'm saying? It's like, if you're dope, we can figure it out quick. How many Buddhas have you inflated? Right, right. But but Muggs was a dick, man. Muggs was cold blooded. Like I learned that from Muggs. He had zero finesse, 10 thumbs. Like he would tell you that's just whack. Nope. Nope, rewrite that shit. Like he was straight faced, straight like that. Like man, what? Man, Muggs was cold, but but everybody respected it who worked with him because mm-hmm. like look at the records he made. Nah, right? definitely, you know what I mean? He knew what he was going for, but I I took note of that too because I always felt like maybe there's another way you can't go through the back door. Yeah. yeah. He's coming mm-hmm. through the front door with a fucking sledgehammer. I'm like, well, maybe I can go through the back door and right. get the same message across. But I learned a lot from Muggs just because Muggs was more of a, a finisher. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. um he knew how to add the little details to his song. Yeah. And I feel like Puff later on would do that too, where I remember mm-hmm. them saying, like, they used to, if a song is three minutes, it's like, motherfucker, you have how many seconds is that? All right, well, every second is accounted for. Mm-hmm. They would play that song over and over for 100 mm-hmm. years. So put the magnifying glass to every mm-hmm. second. And even if it means leave, the, leave it simple, whatever it is, leave it be simple conscious then. of it. Right. Like, care about what you're doing. Exactly. You know? Don't just let it go. Exactly. And um, Muggs is like sure. one of those guys. He was yeah. a, um, sometimes even the beat wouldn't be exactly the way it should sound. He'd get to the studio and start fixing it up. You know, so um, he had a broader uh, vision of how records should be made and also taught me a lot about how to produce outside of just making a beat. Yeah. Because, mm-hmm. like, 
No, but beat this... making is an art, and it could stop end and stop right there. There's some guys who are legends, and they just make beats. Mm-hmm. And they're not tripping. It's like it's mm-hmm. cool if I make a record or somebody raps on mm-hmm. it. I make beats, and I respect those guys a lot. You know what I mean? It's almost like battle rap. No, nah, it's like the ones that are like, damn, you're on some other shit. You don't even care about making a record. You're just, and I respect that as well. But when I came up, it was like learning those pieces mm-hmm. to also make records, and I felt like. Trying to do both, you know. Right, but no, but your catalog goes way left to way right. Yeah. It goes to underground to 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 Jay Z to Kendrick Lamar yeah. or whatever. Like, how is that? How 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 has that been able to? How how have you been able to do that and oh, and man. still stay at this level like that? That part is a mystery. Because you understand what I'm saying? Because yes, you, yeah. you, you've either you're either hip hop hip hop or you're mainstream with this. Yeah. Boom bap or. Ah, you know what I'm saying? Right. Or turn shiny, up, turn shiny, up. It was like the shiny suit era or what everything that was against <laughs> shiny, that. Shiny and suit. you were you're like I'm pretty stubborn kinda, just as a person. <laughs> okay. I think I'm pretty stubborn mm-hmm. and, and like for better or worse. Mm-hmm. And it's like um even touring with M was kind of it's always a trip because you know he's the height of the height and it's right. like I'm on tour with him and it's like, you know, everything you would expect that comes with that, like the security, the big Boom. the jets and all that, and the right. big hotels. And then I'll come off and do my own show. Yeah. A week later, and it'll be like 200 people somewhere in Europe. <laughs> right. And I I love it. Right. Actually, like those shows, like I get a lot from being on stage with him because like, you know, he's just taps into a different world, mm-hmm. which is cool to see that level of it. But then it, it was it's always like humbling and cool to know. It, uh, I could see that and be like, oh, this is it. I got to go here. Yeah. And I, I'm one foot in it. I could just take the other foot and jump over there. Somehow I could make right. it work. Mm-hmm. I'm close enough. Mm-hmm. And it's like when I come home and do the other shit, I lean towards that more because it's just more what's in my heart. You know no, I mean? yeah. So your, yeah. your, your, your heart has bred anthems, Pop. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and that was, up. I don't know how that ends up and it's like, um, just um, being very stubborn, I guess, and, and just swinging the bat continually every year and, um, and linking with the right people because I feel mm-hmm. like I had a lot of phases in my career where working mm-hmm. with certain artists because I used to look up to a lot of producers and, and people mm-hmm. that like, I don't want to say I used to. I look up to a lot of producers. You respect them. You respect, yes, and you respect the like, work. Where does it go from there? Right. You know, because um, working, like, this music always changes. Yeah. You know, and I think sometimes people look at me as, like, a purist. Like, I'm trying to keep mm-hmm. one thing one way. But I, I'm i stubborn, but I mm-hmm. also know that music grows. And I like, I like my young homies. Right. I keep young homies around me all the time. And I like to hear... What they're listening to, right? But and not, then, but but good music is just good 100%. music, one hundred percent. And then, like, a lot of times they they play me shit. I'm like, yo, I like this. Right, like, this is dope. A lot of times they play me shit. I don't get it, right? <laughs> and and and, I, and some of the stuff, depending on who's put me onto it, I give it a little more time. Right, let me give it a more listen. Oh, oh, but if Pop, it, did, did you did you give Holt that record because he went off? He needed to know who was playing in that playlist. Which what? Holt, who got who got the record for you? You got it. Okay. I don't know what in you're the playlist, talking about, man. I'm just saying, to his point of like, man, <laughs> I get that. That's dope. Sometimes. I love it. The whole, whole, whole the record. He, he held, heard a record that he had to have in him. Yeah. Boom. And, and like I said, sometimes you, 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 you'll give it extra time and it'll grow on you and you'll be like, damn. Right. You know, and then other times it's just not your shit. And I'll never lie to myself because I don't want to be that guy either. You know what I'm saying? It's like yeah. trying to tell myself something is dope when I, I don't mm. feel it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I want to talk about what you're doing now, but kind of what you said. There's a question I talked to. uh, I mean, you came up with evidence from Dolly. People's Mm -hmm. like a good friend of yours. Yeah, my brother. Um, I talked to him and he said, you came to him one day and you said, I'm changing my name to The Alchemist. I'm going to step back from rapping. I'm going to make beats. And he was like, it would have been. He told me it was very easy for me. As just a friend, your friend might come to you with an idea and be like, oh, that, whatever. But he was like, something about the way you said it. He, he, knew he, you was, were like, for real. he was like, yo, <laughs> this is uh, gonna work. And we were talking earlier about how you use your name to like, how that influences what you do. So I'm curious, like, yeah. when you changed your name and said, I'm gonna be the alchemist, I'm gonna focus on producing, right? Like, what did that, did, did other things come with that name change? Like, what do you think he picked up on that was like, okay, yeah, I believe you that, that, that will work. I don't know, man. That's like a real eloquent, uh, That's deep, right? <laughs> thank you evidence. I don't know if it really went that way, but I, I shit, I'm always been pretty driven. 
And like when I feel like any of us in here who you get an idea, you like you see it, you kind of gotta give it your best shot to follow it out. So um, I don't know. It was a friend of ours that we grew up with who passed away. My man, Casey, rest in peace. He had a, a project. It was Alchemist something. I forget the other word. He had a project. He was a rapper, mm-hmm. and he told me, "Yo, you should use that name." Because at the time I was Mudfoot, I was coming out of Hooligans, right. and he kind of gave me that name. Yep. And it was like Mudfoot. Yeah, that Mudfoot would have been a tough. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think yeah, it was like the right. legend conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mudfoot. The, the, the yeah. Mudfoot. Some people still know me as Mudfoot, which the is Mudfoot. very strange. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like yo, Mudfoot. Did you Mudfoot. have a, Did you have a logo? You now, I used to always draw like a foot when I was signing, and like, it was yeah, mud, yeah, the mud, yeah, the mud, the mud foot. Yeah. <laughs> It was like it's just something dirty, you it's know. Like coming to the stage, yeah, the mud, mud foot. foot. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. It might have worked, but yes. but I don't. I switched it up, yes. and then um, I, I don't know. It took a long time. I'd say that. Like once I started making beats, I got to give a lot of credit to DJ Lethal from House of Pain because mm. he was he was so he's so dope. Like his beats, people don't know because he, you know, he found different paths and went Limp Biscuit, but like his beats, mm-hmm. SP twelve hundred MPC are nuts and always mm-hmm. have been. Anyone who knows him knows. And um, like, he was the one that took me to, um, to Guitar Center to get the, the ASR. Because I wanted the SP-12. Because everybody I studied from was using the SP-1200. I didn't know anything different. Mm-hmm. And he took me to Guitar Center right after we got the Hooligans deal. And he was mm-hmm. like, yo, get this thing. It's an ASR 10. It's a keyboard. And I'm telling you. I'm like, yo, I don't play keys. I don't know, I don't know how to play piano. He was like, right. trust me. It's not a piano. You can sample on it. And I literally trusted him. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. kind of like bought that shit in it. It was a blessing because it kind of gave me a different sound than all the, like T-Ray was using the SP. Ralph Finn was using the SP. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he was using it. Muggs was. So it was like, mm-hmm. okay, a different weapon. And mm-hmm. I remember like making beats for a long time until I had what I felt was right. something I could present. Gotcha. You know, and it was crazy because Lethal, he told me, you know, he was a DJ first. And he was like, yo, House of Pain got their deal. And I I was I was on. And I had his first beats he ever made were on a platinum album. Right. Mm, yep. He literally grew as a producer with a platinum. With a platinum. Yes. Right. But he was it was like he he, he didn't have time to to refine his sound. Right, right. And I remember like making beats and being whack. Like, I, I, listen, I found some of my old beats. They suck. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll release them one day to give people right. like, yeah, some confidence. Like, trust but, me, you so, can so do let it. Me, so let me ask you that. So, but why, so why do you say they suck? Like, just, they were just innocent and I didn't know what I was doing. Okay. So there might have been some good ideas or good samples, but I just had no idea. I don't but you didn't use the right sounds, maybe? Is I had saying? no tricks. I had no tricks. No bad. tricks. Yeah, no yeah, tricks. Everybody knows. You know, it was okay. like, but some of the samples and ideas were good. And um, it took time for me until I was like, okay, okay. I knew who was out there, and I felt like, not that I could whoop ass, but I could compete. Right. You know Definitely. what I mean? And that was like, bring, bring it on. Yeah. Or like right. when somebody today brought a buck fifty twelve inch. It was like the dead end right. street. And that was that was like one of the first records I did when I moved to New York. And Muggs was like, all right, you out there? I'll put some money up, and we made a twelve inch for my guy buck fifty and put a record out. Bet. I mixed it at D and D. And I felt like I was, you know, Stretch and Bobito were on the radio in New York at the time. Right. And I knew them because of Mighty Mai, who was a friend of mine. And so yep. I used to, like, get records to them and then hearing that shit on there. And they were so ill. They would play it every week for a whole month. Mm. Like, if you were down with them and they, like, and, like, you had a record that you were pushing, they would play it every, you know, they were on every week, once a week. They would play it every week for a month because your record was in Fat Beats. And it mm-hmm. would help sell the twelve inch. Yeah, it, it seems it seems like like throughout your whole. No, that was part of big the ups shit, to like, Fat Beats for sure, yeah, and Stretch and Bob. Yeah, Stretch and Bob. That, that was that was a big Bobby part, that. and that, that meant a lot to all of us. Yeah. Or for me, just moving to New York, like when I did a uh, uh, open mic night. Yep. With High and Mighty, yep. and then, like he used to play it, and it was crazy. You know, rest in peace, K Slade. I was my man. You know, he mm. we did a lot. Me and once later on in the years, once I linked with Prodigy and Mob Deep, K Slade showed us a lot of love. And he and he was like, you remember the, the era when K. Slade was like the man. It was the a man for the, the for, man. The, for the mixtapes, everything. And, and he used to be like, New yo. Music. And he used to be like, yo, you know, give me some shit. I'm going to play it. Yeah. And mm-hmm. me and P would like, we would make us, he would be on every Thursday night. So me and P would make a joint like Wednesday from scratch. We would make a, a brand new record to bring to K. Slade. We would meet him outside at like a gas station. Yo, give him the CD. Cool. Boom. And then Thursday we'd be listening to the radio and it would be... It wouldn't come on. 
And he'd be like, everything he was playing was like, everything you're hearing, you could get on my tape right now at Burkina <laughs> Music Hut right now. Yeah. Right. So he was playing the shit that was in stores that week. So he'd be like, damn. And But then next Thursday, yeah, he's playing our shit immediately nice. because he was in the stores that week. Nice. And he'd be like, what you're hearing right now is in the store. But then the next week, it was over because he would play the next tape. Mm-hmm. So I always loved Stretch and Bob for that because they would give you like a month because we had the vinyl in Fat Beats at the time. And you know... Now it's different, it's hard to put in perspective, but at the time, like, I remember, you know, let's say Evidence, for example, he, he later on in his career would hook up with Atmosphere and, yep. and um, Rhyme Sayers, right. which is an amazing label. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I remember talking to, to Slug one day, once we were like working on Ev shit, and they have a whole ecosystem. Their shit is like incredible how what they built out there. And I remember talking to him like, how did you build this shit? You know, like, mm-hmm. I'm just starting up my shit. I'm like, how, how did you? How did you build this whole thing out here? And he was like, yo, you don't remember? Yeah. I'm like, nah. He goes, we were trying to put out 12 inches when you guys were putting out dilated 12 inches through fat beats. Wow. And we couldn't get mm. any traction. And no, because literally at the time, for a group like Dilated, mm-hmm. we put out, I forget what the first 12 inch was. But the, second the, one, the second uh, one was Work the Angles. Okay, the second one was I Work Third the Third Degree? One was. Maybe. We did two 12 inches. The second one sold a lot of records. And that's how they got their record deal on Capitol. Mm. So it was kind of like a, for some of the underground guys, like, all right, we'll put out a 12-inch two fat beats. If it gets Boom. traction, mm-hmm. it gets on Stretch and Bob, gets on these things, we can get a it record was, deal. It was almost like a system. Yes, it was right. a way to get an actual right. fucking record deal. Right. Like, they got on Capitol, got a real deal. So Slug was telling us, like, yo, we couldn't get a deal. Nobody would sign us. We were this little group in Minneapolis putting shit out through fat beats. Right. Nobody was fucking with us. So he said, like, that's how they built their store. Right. And I said, gotcha. yo, that was the blessing was right. in disguise. It was actually a great thing for you, you know, because right. what, what he built. But uh, it just made me realize, like, at the time, you know, it was an amazing outlet, what we had um, for people like Stretch and Bob, for guys like these mm-hmm. independent artists to, like, literally get on and get a deal. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I, I, love, uh, I love that Stretch and Bob um, documentary. If you haven't seen it, I think it's called uh, Radio That Changed Lives. Mm-hmm. Check that out. Great documentary. But it seems like your whole career has kind of been, uh, you straddled that that lane between like the underground hip hop and then these mainstream hits. And it seems like that has led to where you can work in both worlds and then you take those things you learn and now what you have with uh, your own label and how you operate. Yeah. It seems like you've, and I don't know if this is true, but like you've picked apart what you like from underground and what you may not have liked from mainstream and like apply it to what you're doing. Yeah, you learn as you go along, but I think feel like it's pretty free now. Mm-hmm. It's like um, it's kind of like the Wild West. Like you know, you, what you come up with, you could pull off. And, and to be honest, I I make mistakes every drop, mm. every single drop I do. I'm like, damn, what did we do wrong here? Okay, take because like, all right, most of us who do music in here who created we didn't never come into the game like yo I'm gonna be in retail one day <laughs> right I, that wasn't on my chalkboard right you know? okay so at some point after dealing with so many like labels suck man they fucking suck and they will suck the energy out of you as an artist and, yes, and, and everybody has a different experience. Not closed sessions, though. Just yeah. making that clear. Yeah, just We're going to make that clear right I mean, now. Co- just making yeah, it clear. He's big, wearing a T-shirt. He big, wouldn't wear labels, that if we would labels, Not independent labels. I'm talking about like corporate <laughs> Some scenarios. Label labels. They suck. They label suck. labels. They suck. We just had, me, me, me and Andrew just had this. Yeah. We were just having this conversation. And, and I have friends who are young guys who are doing deals now with big labels. Right. And I have to hold myself back. From saying this shit to them because I don't want to be that guy that's like right. jaded. That's like, man, okay, you had an experience that right. wasn't, wasn't good. Now you want to throw that shit on me. Let me have, let me, let me so go. Let me through. live. Let me live. And I understand that. Right. So that's why I fall back sometimes, you know. Right. And, but so I really want them to fast forward because I, I, a part of me wants to be like, man, you're gonna sign this fucking deal. They're gonna tell you everything you want to hear. They're, they're gonna say you have your creative control and you're gonna do all this shit. It's gonna be cool for a minute. And then you're gonna walk in meetings and realize that they're pitching shit to you. They already had the meeting before you were there, right? About mm, this shit. Now they're right. trying to sell you on it, making you think it's right. your idea. And yep. you, you'll go through this, and eventually you'll get up out of that shit and survive. And you know, and that's why I love people like Currency. Mm. You know, like when I linked up with him, and I was like, damn, because he got a taste of that bullshit early on. He was cash mm. money, it, it no mm. limit. He had a lot of like experience. Yeah, cash mm-hmm. money, no limit. He had a lot of uh, Warner. Yeah, he had commercial experiences, and I think he at some point f- cracked a code where he was like, "Man, 
what do I want out of this shit? Right. Yeah. You know? He I, says something like that on um the continuance. He says something like, I found my I found my sound, dove in it. I can't, I'm did. gonna mess up the lyric, but he talked about that. Yeah, and I, I love him for that because I feel like he kind of built like a, a formula. And sometimes when I hook up with new artists, I'm like, what do you want to do? You want to go big or you, you want that currency mm-hmm. formula? And it sounds like the currency <laughs> one is the latter. I prefer that one. Mm-hmm. It just depends who you the are longevity. as a person. Yeah. Yes. Because what he built in the lane he did, mm-hmm. the lane he created, mm-hmm. yep. is kind of amazing. Right, lane he's still move, yes. moving freely in. Like, you know, he wants his dogs. He smokes his weed. He got his low riders. He got his crib. He yep. has all the things that he wants in his life. He's right. the coolest dude, man. If they're so not cool. talking about him on the list at the end of the year, if he's not fucking the famous chick, or it's not you know, all these things that come along with all the extras, right? he ain't tripping. He's cool. Yeah, and, and I respect that. So mm-hmm. I feel like... Um, now when it's so I went through the when I did my solo shit I did it through Koch yep. which was mm-hmm. kind of an indie label kind at the time of. you know but even then it was a lot of bullshit you know mm-hmm. and then once I fizzled down from that I got up out of there and started messing with the indie companies like the Nature Sounds and the Decon which became Mass Appeal later right mm-hmm. and those yep. were all cool like shout out to all of them those are my friends but even those smaller systems where it was like just one or two people I was like we're bumping heads and this shit ain't the way mm-hmm. I'm like, you know what? I'm mm-hmm. at the ground floor. Let me just clear it out. And you know, when I was doing Do Rag Dynasty, or yep. when I was doing mm-hmm. like yep. um, certain records, it was like I wanted to do it as AOC at the time, but I wasn't ready yet. Mm-hmm. You know, even a Covert Cooper shit like that or Rare, Rare Chandeliers. It was like, yep. I wasn't ready yet, but I was trying it because I I knew I could do like the music part, but it was yep. like, mm-hmm. the business. Okay, how do we go from here? Yeah, right. because like I said, like we didn't plan to do retail. Right. And now I'm like, this shit is like up to me. Right. You know, like I gotta figure price points out. But right. see, as a kid, I was a collector of vinyl. I bought and you know, I'm making the, the Bo Jackson cards. I bought cards as a kid. Yep. I collected mm-hmm. them. Yep. So, you know, I always been a collector of shit. So I, I like to think when I'm making my product like a person who's buying it. Even when I do the merch, it's like sometimes they'll be like, yo, trust me, this will sell. Mm-hmm. Like friends who I work with who do my art. And I'm like, yeah. But uh, if I don't right. sometimes I'll give in because I don't want to be a Dumbass, you know. Right, what I'm right. People like some shit, and I don't like it. It's cool, but you know, I always base things on what I like, and even with music, you know, like well, we're doing this Rock Marcy album right now. Like we have thirty-five songs. You know what I'm saying? The Rock is like one of my favorite rappers, mm. maybe my favorite rapper of all time. You know, wow. one of my favorite. Wow. Time. And I'm like, we got it. You know, we just got to cut it down, but some stuff has to go. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's like, um, yeah, just learning how to refine shit as mm. we go on. And, yeah, yeah, so um, I would like we were talking about this a little earlier, but as you approach the projects now, where you have like, all right, the art will look this way, we'll drop it this way. You know what your fans want. Does it take it? I'm not. I'm not like I don't know if it takes pressure off the music, but does it frame the way like it's like the music is now part of a whole experience? Does it change the way at all you look at when you're formulating these these drops or deciding I'll do an instrumental album, I'll do this little like. I was telling you, uh, some of my favorite projects of yours recently are more the like, they feel like pause tapes because you're like yeah. chopping things up. Yeah. Where it's like, are you looking at it now holistically? Does it take any pressure off the specific music where it's like, I'm going to have the art, the drop, the baseball nah. cards? No, nah. nah, music, the music is cavalier. Like, you know, it's you can't cavalier. put no bullshit out with some nice art. Right. That's <laughs> not going to work. Right. And I, you know, obviously, like we spend the, enough time. the nice art, the merch, and all that other stuff is like the cherry on top. Yeah, it's yeah, that. no. It's and important. the music is definitely the soundtrack of the vision of Absolutely. all those things. I think most gotcha. of the time when I work with artists, I usually send them the album too. Mm. You know, like, I want you to feel invested in this shit mm-hmm. as much as we are. I want you to care. And, you know, most of the artists I work with feel the same way. Like, mm-hmm. I, want, I don't want the mastering guy to be doing 10 things that day that we're mastering. Right. Mm-hmm. I want you to care. Right. And and uh, be invested in it. You know what I'm saying? And, and care about the shit that we're doing. And uh, now, nah, and, and you know, um, when it comes to like the art for a lot of this shit, I usually try to find people that are not popping. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the art that I use for like the vinyl and shit, I'll just go hunting if it's Instagram or through people that I know. I'll go look mm-hmm. and just find people through different hashtags and shit. I, most of the people are from different countries. Sometimes I really mm-hmm. don't care. Okay. What I care about is how many followers they got. Mm-hmm. If they got crazy followers and they're already popping, I'm cool. And most of the time those You're people, cool meaning I don't want to fuck with them. Fuck and they, with they're them. good already. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I try to find the ones that are like 
lower and uh, mm-hmm. and have dope art. That's what baseball card collecting is kind of. But all it's about like, too. yo, just because it's not about numbers nowadays. Is yeah. everything about numbers? But there is a lot of talented people who may not have that shot because. Somebody their numbers them, aren't right, 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 right. Or maybe if I give them a shot and go, yo, I, do this final, you know, I got a little outlet, people, and then maybe you get some eyes on your art and your art starts right. going up. No, to I, me, I that's this cool. Conver- yeah, I had this conversation yeah. all the time with a lot of the companies that I work with, console for whatever, like we got to change the vision, change the understanding of the social currency. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The person with a million, million followers. Yeah, he got a million followers. That's dope. But that person with the the other follow the 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 smaller numbers is probably still able to move hungry. around and Freedom. hungry and and, and, and and touch. And when you see the ones that got a lot of followers, if they do art, you go through their shit. Mm-hmm. It's all you realize. Oh, they hit a lick with this one style, and they just mm-hmm. stayed on it, right? Because that's what everybody asks. It's like right. a girl who posts a picture of their ass, and it's like <laughs> they get so many followers. That's right. it. Right. They're posting those pictures right. every time it's on. Like right. you know you how. Three times a day, a victim, booty, butt shot, butt shot. Three times. I feel a that day. same way about algorithms. Like sometimes I'm like, yo, fuck algorithms, man. Right. Yep. They're trying to predict me too much. Y'all know, right. you know me too Let's well. Let's clap it up. Right. Fuck the algorithm. Yeah. Like fuck, the algorithms fuck, is fuck the algorithm. Of, like we all have our own personal robot who knows us so fucking well. Yep. They could just yep. tell you, oh, no, no, you're gonna like this shit right yep. here. You know yep. what I'm saying? Yep. That kind of, I mean, it is where we're going with yep. it, and that's where the world is. But at the same time, sometimes it's in the same way. It's yep. like we become victims of that shit. Like I, if I post a video of me making a beat or playing a beat, I know it's gonna go up crazy. But am mm-hmm. I gonna post those every day and become a victim of views? Right. Or am I gonna do what feels right to nah, me? No, but no. On that and day, on that day, you felt like you were feeling something yes. in this beat. Yes. Like, oh man. This, <laughs> and this, I love doing those. Yeah. 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 And I, and I feel like, you know, it's just being conscious of that shit and not yeah. becoming a victim of it because. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's where we're at. Nah, you I remember hitting on your profile and you were like making a beat to a police chase. At yeah, one point. I, did that one time. I watched, yeah, it's a bad habit. I watched police chase. LA, in LA, there's a police chase like damn it's like all, all the time. It's pretty lawless. I don't know mm-hmm. these days out here. But LA is wild. Probably yeah, in Chicago. It's pretty, yes, it's yes. Chicago. It's pretty lawless in Chicago, <laughs> too. Chases, too? Like the uh, a little wild uh, running and. Well, yeah, it's not them. as um as much of a driving city as LA, so right. it's not yeah, like yeah, the yeah. highway chase, but yeah, it's pretty crazy. It's a whole that's a whole yeah. different. Like you can get away. Yeah. I'm not advertising it. Don't don't <laughs> don't run from the cops. But you get away. Yeah, yeah. we gotta just make sure Lori Lightfoot. Look, allegedly, you can allegedly, <laughs> allegedly, get, away. Yeah. allegedly, uh, allegedly you can get away. You can get away. Right. right, allegedly. That's what I heard. Um, right. I was wondering too, like how much, if at all, did the pandemic accelerate, like what you're doing now with ALC Records? Did it play a part at all? Because it felt like in that, in the COVID, like the real shutdown, everything, yeah. like you just. Took all you really catapulted. Yeah, you just you, the Conway, it's Freddie fucking Gibbs. Weird to say with it, I kind of enjoyed the pandemic because mm-hmm. I was home. I'm already a home person, so like mm-hmm. being able to stay in and when times when I would go out, it was empty and it was like mm-hmm. it kind of felt. I don't know. It was like a weird time when I think about it because we were all reaching out via like FaceTime with all your mm-hmm. friends, and yep. it was like I was I felt compelled to do those like um, DJ sets that I did it. During that mm. time, which now I feel like, yeah, I got to do more of that shit. But it was like, it made sense at the time because we were all at home. All at the crib, yeah. Yeah, and it was like, ah, I want to I wanna let some shit off. And right. yeah, um, since everything is back out, yeah, I mm-hmm. have noticed like some of the stuff cool off as far as sales. Mm-hmm. Because naturally, any business that was like a internet business, if mm-hmm. you were selling shit online, yeah, mm-hmm. you were killing it during killing that time. It. Everybody was at home, yeah, had more time. And, Plenty of money to just now they can go bread. now they yeah. can go yeah. touch things. And yeah, you can go on vacation around. again. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have less money to just spend on some B- bullshit. Shit. So, yeah, <laughs> right, it, was, right. it was good. It was a good right. time, and I think it, um, I did notice it a little, but it was like, you know, yeah. Right. Um, I read uh, you said in another interview that you f- you feel like the rapper's voice is the last instrument yeah. of a track. Mm. Um, how much, like, how do you consider that in, 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 in making music? Do you think about these people you collaborate with? Like, are you, how, I guess, like, how does that yeah. register in your main? Are you, are you planning out, like, all right, Rock's voice is like this, yeah. Freddie Gibbs' voice is like this? I always, like, depending on, like, like, Mock probably doesn't even know, but when I was working with Mock Hami, I was making so many beats with him in mind mm. that I mm. probably didn't even, we, he didn't even use or like. And I do that a lot. I think all producers do that. Whether you have an acapella, 
Mm-hmm. Some of it is like not good. like Prodigy acapellas don't make beats for them because everything's gonna sound good. Mm-hmm. It's not fair. Mm-hmm. You have a beat, but like, yeah, it's just crazy. It's just because mm-hmm. his rhymes. You know, mm-hmm. he's yeah. so good as this a rapper. His voice, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think yeah. he's being more pre- more like I listen to Prodigy more and more now, and it's just like, yeah, he was not given even the like right. Nah, deserve. Mm-hmm. his voice is one of a kind. But mm-hmm. we all, I think, we imagine voices when we're making beats, mm-hmm. or you'll, well, you know. Anybody who rap who makes beats, always I feel like had an advantage, you know, mm-hmm. like because you're cons- you're leaving room for that, mm-hmm. and and um, when I'm like every day I pretty much make beats, okay, because I go to the studio every day, so like I'll do some, I'll throw a needle on a fucking record every day. I might make hook up a beat. I'm pretty random with it. And I'm real scatterbrained, so I might make three beats one day. I might just mm-hmm. listen to samples one day. I might, but I'm I'm doing something every day. You know what I mean? Do, do you just strictly make beats at the crib or in your space, or like do you have like a little setup that you might pull out on the plane, put your headphones on, and work mm-hmm. out or whatever? Good like class. like like what do you, like what yeah. do you? How do you do it? Like what is that? I have a sometimes I'll do shit like that, like travel. But what I like doing is like throwing myself in a fucking odd situation or mm-hmm. putting myself in a place that's out of my comfort zone mm-hmm. or like I know one time when M was working on his album at Rick Rubin's studio but they were using all the rooms in Malibu and he had like one room that was where people slept in it yeah. wasn't even a studio room and I set up the equipment and just made shit there every hand. day and he had the window where you could see the ocean mm. and it was like a couple beats on Fetty that I used that were from that those those mm. like beat tapes but sometimes I like going places out of your comfort zone like take a bag of records and just Go over here. Yeah. This is what I'm making the beats out of. I'm going over and here that's today. What it is. And you get a different energy. You know what I'm saying? Because you have, you know, even just working with Marcy, you know, right now, and, and yeah. we're doing the album. And it was like, how do we get a different result? He's so good. Right. His mm. beats are so right. good. He doesn't need a producer. Mm. So in the beginning, when we were picking records, you know, he was picking beats. Like I noticed a lot of the shit he was picking to write to sounded like close to what he might have done. Right. And the beats that I was making that were a little different, he was kind of shying away from. Right. And then I, mm-hmm. at one point, we had a talk where I was like, dude, you're so good on your own. You're, you're flawless as Rock Marcy, mm-hmm. right? But if you bring me in, you maybe by doing different stuff, you'll get a different result. Right. We all know what we could do on our own. And a mm-hmm. lot of us, like, we have our, we're, we're in our bag. We could go home. We could make, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like Thelonious. You could go no, right now. That's my man Thilo. He he's incredible. No, did you he, know he no. could he used to call me his white uncle. Thilo. That's my no man. Joke. But as an example, he could just make a good beat any given day because he's mm. dialed in with his style. Yeah. So in order for us to make some shit that'll be out of our zone, we have to go somewhere else, mm-hmm. bring in someone else. And that's why I collaborate sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know, one time like a couple years ago, Boy Wonder came to LA, come through, work mm-hmm. on some beats together. Mm-hmm. There's a couple of different people over the years that I'll collab with and like um you know, me and Fred Reck, I went over to the studio. That's how we made the record for um, Anderson. Mm. Got gotcha. you. to the studio one day to work with him. Got gotcha. you. Know, he at Dre's spot. And just bringing in different energy. So I feel like, of course, if I'm at home, I'm going to throw the needle. I'm going to make a beat every day. But I look forward to those situations where I could like, you know, let's just go different. In. Yeah, yeah. No doubt. Not to change, but like, I did want to ask this, and I don't think we could ask, uh, have this conversation without talking a little bit about Mob Deep. I'm just curious, like, when you moved to New York, did you like have a like a goal? I want to link up with these these dudes. Did you know like this relationship would be such a career defined like no, not no, defining, not. but uh uh-uh. uh I was just going to NYU and but Muggs had already worked with them and Muggs was my big brother. So when I moved to New York, pretty much everybody I met in the first years when I was going to NYU was through Muggs. Okay, mm-hmm. my man Renee, who was a big tattoo did you go to, artist. Did you go to class? <laughs> I went to class. Okay, college was great. Okay, I, at college was fun. I learned a lot of shit. I had mm, met a lot, a lot new, of girls. New people. Like college was amazing. I just didn't know what the fuck I was gonna do with this shit. It wasn't like I didn't know it wasn't where it was like, going. How yeah. am I gonna my, yeah. make a business or do? I didn't have any direction. I was like super doing music already, so it, it kind of made sense for me to just go the music route. You yep. know what I mean? Yep. Yep. So, so as we're wrapping up, I like go. I would just ask. My question would just be like. Do you have a favorite record that mm. you've ever done? Mm. Damn. Out of the thousands of records, I'm sure. But like, what's this thing that you just like, when you hear it, it, it makes you just feel like, oh, you got to see. I, I, re- like I, re- I remember that. To, I remember that. I would say probably keep it thorough just because. So good. So that, good. That joint, 
like I remember when we did the realist, just taking it back to Mob Deep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, Muggs hooked us up, and I didn't know we would grow into the relationship we did. But when once they saw me in New York, doing my, own, you know, I first hooked Muggs was like, "Yo, link with Infamous Mob. These are these Mob Deep's young homies." I linked with them. We did Thug Music at D and D. That was gonna be from Muggs' album, first Soul Assassins album. Muggs actually looked out. I called him and said, "Yo, these dudes are gonna let me." They played it for P and Havoc. They want to use it in the Mob Deep album. To use it. Muggs like paid for that session, and he okay. actually was like, "Don't worry, go ahead, do some other shit." He, you know, he actually looked out, and let that happen. Yeah. And um, so we linked, and uh, they brought Infamous Mob brought me to Havoc and P. And I remember I had the realest on a dat. It was like a interlude between beats. Because mm. at the time, it was, that, that beat is a one-shot beat. Crazy. Like, it literally is like, doom, 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 doom. There's no mm. fancy work to that shit. It was just pitch it up, EQ it, and they rhymed crazy. But when I had it on the dad at the time, I was kind of insecure because those joints we used to put on dad in between the beats. Like in a Pete Rock album or a, or like a Gangstar album. Mm-hmm. Remember they used to have the interludes mm-hmm. or Lord Finesse. It was like they would... The beats on the album were always crafty, but it right. would, if it was a one shot, it would be like just an interlude. Mm-hmm. Yep. I kept calling that shit an interlude. Like on everything I love, there was going to be a Defari interlude for Focus Ooh, Daily. Defari. Defari. That Yo. was going to be Defari. a Defari interlude. Wow. And P, I would go see the studio and P would be there and not have it. And I play this all my beats and he'd skip through them and go to that one and go, I like this one. I like this one. And then I, the next day I come over there and Havoc would be there, but not P. Mm-hmm. And he'll go through the dat. And he'll, Yo, I like this one. I'm like, yo, you, your man. He said the same thing. That's crazy. And um, I was kind of discouraged because they didn't like any of my beats. They were like, yeah. they just like this fucking yeah. joint where it was like an interlude. Yep. yep. And um, then one day, obviously, P called me and said, yo, come to the studio, G Rap. And I showed up. We did the record. And, and, that, was, th- and that was that, right? And, and then that we did that in Thug Music. And then it was like, so then I was kind of like known, but it was like, it could be a good sample, you know? Maybe the guy's <laughs> just stumbling on the record. Right. And when we did Keep It Thorough, I felt like it kind of at least proved that it wasn't some, like, he just found a good record. Right. right. You know, because we, I remember P was, like, a little sick when we did that vocal. So his, if you listen, his shit is kind of nasally. Nasally. Mm. Yeah. He was a little sick. I think we were in L.A. even when we did that. But that's the joint that when you that's hear. That's my joint. That's the joint that when you hear, you're like, oh, uh, yes. It meant a lot to me because yes. it felt like, I remember, like, Chris, uh, yeah. not Chris, like, uh, Steve Rifkin mm-hmm. was, like, you know, Dante Ross, also my man, who also helped me a lot over the years Dante and always Ross. showed me love. No, Dante like, he was, very well. Yeah, mm-hmm. he was trying to get me a production deal at the time, but That's after that record, when I did that record, and he was like, yo, we want to give you a... At the time, you would do shit like a 10-beat deal. Mm-hmm. And they'd be like, pay you in, in advance for like 10 beats, half of it, and then mm-hmm. you would just owe them 10 beats. Wow. We never did that shit. I kind of, you know, because you never really would, would fulfill it. Right, no, right. No, right. I, I, have friend, I have friends that like sign deals like that and still have no, never done hustle. the beats. Yeah, it was so. a good hustle. It never materialized, but Dante was one of the early people who always like supported me. Clark Kent, every exactly. time yeah, I would exactly. be in the studio with Mob, yeah. because Mob had a studio called Soundtrack. They used to work at a studio called Soundtrack mm-hmm. in New York. And in the, there was like three rooms. They would work in the first room, and and Buster had the other room, and it was Chris Lighty. You know, he was like his, all his clients. Yep. And it was like Violator. Yeah, and I remember like remember Clark Kent coming mm-hmm. one day and being like, "You that fucking guy that made that yeah. shit, that's, yo man." That's, he gave that's, me a lot of confidence. You know what I mean? That's like, big homie. That's yeah. That's that's and, number six. That's number six. That's yeah. number six. That's legend, legend conversation. Number yes. Six. Yeah. Clark, shout out to Clark Kent. Yeah. But yeah, um, people like that. Remember one day Buster came because you know Buster used to see me with Cypress. Mm. You know, because I used to tour with Cypress Hill every year. I would just roll and like carry Muggs records and shit. Mm. And, and blow uh, up the Buddha, man. Don't sell yourself yes. short. I, I did that Don't as well. And uh, I used to carry Twilight Tones records too. Shout out to Twilight Tone, a legend in this house, man. Uh, yeah, yeah. Salute, man. Look, look, look. I used Woo, to legend. Twilight carry Tone. Tones records. And he would have that SP12 like it was like a, a laptop. Like Word. almost everything. <laughs> yes. Can, okay. Can, my back tone. Can I, can I just shout out Chris Spurlock? He would carry some of my records sometimes. <laughs> Spurlock, I don't know records. Yes. <laughs> Fuck with you, man. Thank because you, because DJ, no, have, have you? Do you know his name, DJ RTC? Oh, are you, are you talking about uh, Roosevelt Treasure, Treasure Chest? Chest. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, I know yes, about that. Roosevelt, I know Roosevelt about Treasure that. Chest. Yeah, I know yes, about sir. That. That's You're, my the, man. The first drop you gave me, though, <laughs> you kind yes. of play. You were like Theodore Sizzles Chips. <laughs> That's fire, actually. 
That's I like have one recorded one. Theodore, Theodore, Theodore Fizzle, Fizzle chips. chips. And then you said, AKA like Franklin <laughs> something. Like, I got it all. It's recorded. a crazy name, it's man. It's a crazy name. Yeah, that yeah, would be a hell name. of a group. Theodore Thizzle Chips and Mudfoot. And yeah. featuring Mudfoot. Featuring Mudfoot. Yeah, he was like, this is Alchemist nice. with my man, Theodore Sizzle, Sizzle Chips. chips. <laughs> wow. My bad. I my might bad. put it on, maybe put it on a 101 45, just looped and say, hey, 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 listen. Like, <laughs> um, but man, uh, before we go, I wanted to, uh, you won, or not won, I don't know if it's an award they officially give out, but Complex called you 2021's uh, best producer. Mm. I'm just curious, you know, do you take it with a grain of salt, but like, if you appreciate that all, or if it's different than if you would have won that when you were, like you said, in the Keep It Thorough days, like, does it mean anything different to to, to have that? In 2021, like the stage of your career you're in, did it hit you in any way? I mean, recognition is always cool, you know. I appreciate it. It's, you know, flowers. But yeah, that's 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 dope. That. Let me get that. Let me know? get that. I appreciate it. I mean, you know, opinions. You know, everyone's gonna have a different one, and mm. if if they certain people feel like, oh, yo, you're doing your thing, it's cool. I'm I, I'm out for blood every year. You know? mm. That's how I feel about it. So I mm. I love. And all the producers that I compete with, I love. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I think producers have a different camaraderie than rappers. Mm -hmm. You know, like all the dudes that I respect are like my comrades, you know, the ones that kick my ass. And I can mm -hmm. sit here and name them all day. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? No. But, but um, uh, yeah, I, I, hey, <laughs> just getting any bit of love is cool. So, you know. So, so real quick, to the crowd before we leave, Favis Alchemist record. Two seconds. Let's go. Hello? Over there to the left? Room on the left? Okay, okay. My, but, my favorite beat I think you did is a song. Um, I think it's on The Weatherman. It's called uh, Let Yourself Go. And you yeah. rap on that, too. Yeah, yeah. Shout to Evidence. That's and my bro. everyone I talked to, and when I was like interviewing people every week, and you would come up, they would always be like, I'm always telling out to rap more. Nah. Are you going man. to return to rap? Everyone, nah, everybody's like, he on, needs to rap more. Nah, I'm telling you, man. You everybody, crazy? Everybody. I rap for fun. Rap is like therapy for me. That's mm -hmm. why when I do it, it's like with evidence or with oh no, mm -hmm. it's fun. It's even when I first hooked up with Mob Deep, when Twin was like my close friend. Yeah, me and him became the closest. You got just you. randomly, and so that's how we ended up making music together. Like, because I was just like, yeah, you, I, I don't take like I feel like I could compete mm -hmm. as a producer. Mm -hmm. Rap. Is like even when any of my friends get on the record, I'm like, man, you guys are, or like they know there was a certain rapper that I'll leave nameless that I had worked with recently. Okay, that wasn't that good. Okay, and I couldn't believe it because they were a big rapper, and I remember calling like Boldy or, or Rock or Evidence, going, "Yo, right. man, thank you guys, man." They're like, "What do you mean?" I'm like, "You guys are really fucking good. Like, yeah, right. you come in, you write a rhyme on the spot. You guys are like contract gotcha. killers. I, I didn't realize about this other guy. This, was, this wasn't other guy. second nature uh, because a lot of know. guys who made a lot of money. I don't know. Are, it's not a prerequisite. Right. right. So I'll just say for mm, the ones yep, that do right. it. Yep. Yep. Well, I respect you, that shit. It's if, amazing. If rapping, you, and I'll say this too mm -hmm. because rapping is more technical than beat making. Mm -hmm. you, there's so okay. many little things you could do with your voice that could change and alter. You know, like I don't, I really respect her. If I ever have to rap, mm -hmm. like record something, yeah, I'm so nervous and I'm by myself in the studio. Like, oh, I'll wow. wake up at six really? in the morning and be pacing, <laughs> like, fuck, I gotta, and I'll go and record it. Like, I'll treat it like Jay Z is in the room watching me. Mm -hmm. do, do you have yeah. just, do you yeah. just, just have just raps? to put that pressure on myself? Just because rapping is like you're channeling an energy, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? You went, we produce also, but it's like. Something's gonna flow through you and then go to the mic. Yep. You're not bigger than that shit. You know what I'm saying? And you wow. kind of gotta like humble yourself and just catch that moment because there's like gonna be that one take or that one thing you do on the mic and that's it. And when you do that, it's recorded and it's played for the rest of eternity. So I feel like anyone who raps really good or like if you've been in the studio before and somebody did a one take, and you're just like, that's it. That's it. It's a song. Like I hear it. you're listening to them say the rhyme. And it already sounds like a record. Yep. And, and that's, that's that. the magic shit that is just like, you have to get out of the way. Well, we got hella producers here. Mano, Ty Hill. Of course. Shut the Mano, man. Thelonious, Legend, all yeah. that, all that. Ty Hill. We, we, everybody's here. Hey, man. Tone yeah, rude. Let's million, get it. dollar, dollar, dollar. <laughs> For the old school fans. Sorry, Mano. I don't know where you are, bro. Sorry, sorry. Right. That's how I know you. Um, that's the OG. How, yeah. 
He, mm-hmm. Man, the treaty crew, bro. The crown. That's right. All day. Cool. Um, That's but, so far. But Al, we have to we have to end because we're gonna have a public party. You're gonna DJ yes. in a little bit. Yes, yeah, stick around. Um, I just want to sincerely thank you for coming. I was gonna ask you to start the interview. Just why did you even decide to do this? Because you did not need to do it at all. But I thank you for thank telling you. me. Okay, bet sounds good. Absolutely. <laughs> and then we put it all together, man. This I've is been a pitching. dope series right here, man. Thank I really you, appreciate man. what you guys are doing, man. Thank it's good you, for the city. Thanks for saying salute to you, you guys, brother. man. Appreciate you, brother. Thank, thank you. My man. favorite, my favorite. We gonna make it in wet wipes. Camera. Yes. Oh, that's good. Yes, my man. Salute. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And yes, sir. thank y'all for coming out too. You know, I really appreciate it. Y'all that. make some it's noise. Real. Give it up for the alchemist, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Legend. Legend conversation number five. Great man. And, and real quick, again, thanks to um, Remova Brewery. Had uh, beers for each one of our last three, with the beer of ours for for Alchemist. You're an IPA fan. It's good. Yeah, this is a really good beer. Actually, yeah. Um, shout to them, man. Shouts to Rock Don Julio uh, yeah. for the cocktails. There's a blog era cocktail for all of you that are my age that came up in the blog era. If you want to rock with that, go for yes. it. But um, you're invited to stay for the party. Please pick up a gift bag. Yep. If you haven't yet, those are going to be gone soon. And shout man, out, Al, though. Thank shout you out to so Juggernaut. Much. Shout oh, yeah, to the, Juggernaut shout to, you know what? Shout to the whole blog era, man. Yep, Y'all yep. were very influential, man. Shout to shout Andrew out. in the building. Shout to Jeff. Shout to you, all the blog shout era. Out. That shit was an important time, man. Yeah, for real. I mean, we could we could really talk for several hours. Yeah, that's a whole other uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean. <laughs> you, shout out to Dorian, too, guys. Give it up yes. for the great venue, man, Salute for having Dorian. us. Salute. Shout out to Dorian for... For, for rocking with us in these sessions and, and everything, man. And, and, Shout out to y'all. Oh, and uh, and Johnny Walker, who's in that blog era. Yes, Johnny sure. Walker. Yeah. But ultimately, thank you all for coming. Please stick around. Thank you, yes. Alchemist, man. Hope you had a great, great time. It's going to be nice. What up, V? Salute, Peace. baby. Salute. Yep. Yeah.